by biodiversity and conservation degree at Macquarie. And then I uh, sort of, yeah, for the past decade, I guess, uh, spent a lot of time traveling around Australia and locally, just exploring and looking for wildlife and, you know, seeing what I can find, documenting it and figuring out the natural world, but in particular, uh, terrestrial fauna for yeah, all the animals that you'll find on land don't really spend much time in the ocean. Uh, I have plenty to keep me occupied on land. And so as a bit of an introduction, uh, I'll sort of refer to this a bit later throughout my talk. Uh, what some very smart people have done is divided Australia into these biogeographic regions, which is mainly based off sort of geology um, and, you know, the different topography and locations within the country. And as a very direct result of, you know, the geology of the land, that directly influences the flora, which directly influences the fauna. And so, you know, for each of these different areas, you will be getting different assemblages of fauna. Um, and this is also really what's making one area more biodiverse than another or different you know, uh, levels of diversity. And obviously there's very different climactic conditions in such a large place as Australia. But of course, there are many, many, many places on this map that I couldn't possibly have time to talk about. So I've sort of uh, broken it down into a different map, which sometimes people refer to. And so you can see that on the right, uh, it's been overlaid that previous map. So you can still see all the other different biogeographic regions, but they've sort of grouped similar ones together. Even then there's 10 on that map and I don't have time for that. So I'll be talking tonight about five of them. So the monsoonal tropics, I'll be talking about Kakadu National Park, and then talking about the wet tropics, sort of the Northern wet tropics area. Obviously in subtropical areas as well, temperate, which we are lucky enough to live in and a little bit of the southern desert as well. So yeah, about half of the areas and I've visited a few of the others, but not all of them. I'm yet to go to Western Australia. Now, rather than just sort of dumping a bit of negativity at the end of my presentation, I thought I'd dump it at the start as well. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, I'll be talking about a lot of biodiversity and a lot of wonderful animals, uh, but it isn't a problem-free scenario. Uh, our lifestyles and consumption definitely contribute to land clearing. Uh, you know, that's probably the largest problem. And I guess living in Australia, we often consider ourselves quite good and uh, you know, often look at other countries. I remember growing up, you'd always hear about Borneo and its land clearing, but we are definitely not blameless uh, and we have a lot, you know, to answer for. And then, of course, a lot of different feral species, which all sort of wreak havoc, uh, particularly feral cats and foxes. Uh, of course, another thing that a lot of uh, people don't really hear about much, and it's not talked about a lot, is inappropriate fire regimes. Uh, that has a very, very strong impact on changing how ecosystems look and then, of course, what uh, wildlife can live and, you know, occur successfully within that uh, area. Of course, relating back to our land clearing and consumption, we are very good at creating monocultures, but biodiversity does not like monocultures at all. Uh, you know, it needs structural diversity. Uh, for lots of different uh, animals to occur, lots of different flora to occur, and that ties back into soil health and, you know, uh, the water table and the water cycle. So it's a very complex um, sort of ecosystem, no matter where you look. Uh, and then, of course, all of these factors have led to the highest mammalian extinction rate in the world, which is very, very sad. Uh, even within Sydney, like I live on the northern beaches and uh, they've looked at remains from middens, which are only about, you know, just under 2,000 years old. Uh, and from then till now, you've already lost about 15 mammal species just right here in Sydney. Uh, so they identified brush-tailed rock wallaby from that midden and long-nosed potteroo, rufous betong, uh, paddy melon, 
you know, a lot of different mammals which we've already lost. Um, and then finally, basically all human problems, no matter what they are, stem from our lack of hardcore nature. We've really left ourselves with little slithers of nature here and there within cities and even within most of the country. But what we really need for our mental health and physical health and everything is to have exposure and, you know, almost fully immersive exposure to natural areas that are in really good condition. Um, and that doesn't just benefit us, but it benefits nature. So with all that negativity aside, uh, I will show you a map, which you might be a bit confused about. You're probably sick of hearing Greater Sydney. I know I am. But uh, the reason I'm showing you this map is because it probably is quite a good uh, thing to picture in your mind throughout my talk when I'm mentioning the size of a lot of different places. So basically between Wollongong and about, you know, near Tugra and all the, most of the Blue Mountains area, uh, that totals 1.2 million hectares. So now I will get on to some more interesting stuff, but keep that in mind, 1.2 million hectares and that area there. When I talk about the monsoonal tropics area, uh, specifically Kakadu National Park, which is just shy of 2 million hectares. And so that's basically, you know, the entire area from Wollongong up to Newcastle. So it's a very big area and the entirety of that area is a national park. Um, and it's in, you know, pretty good condition. Um, and of course, it's a World Heritage Area. I really hope that some of you have at least had the opportunity to visit Kakadu National Park. I was lucky enough uh, to visit back in February of this year. Um, but yeah, you really, really have to go there at some point in the future. It is just incredible. Um, it's got a lot of different habitat types as well, because you can see it goes right the way to the coast. So you get these mangrove forests, but I guess the two things that it's most well known for are the really large, impressive sandstone escarpments and also the floodplains. Um, and then a little overview down the bottom of the different animals that you can get there. So a lot of different reptile species, um, a lot of birds as well some very, very interesting mammals which are endemic to there. So they're only found within Kakadu. Same with the reptiles. Uh, for example, there's the Owen Pelly Python, uh, which was only known to Western science uh, in about the 1980s, I think it was. Uh, it was known to traditional owners a long, 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 long time before then. But yeah, there's a lot to discover, I guess, um, or rediscover in a way. And a lot of interesting amphibians as well. And it's hard to uh, mention Kakadu National Park or even the Northern Territory itself without thinking of crocodiles. Uh, so this was a nice freshwater crocodile uh, that I got to photograph at night. Um, it was very tame in a way, I guess. Um, it was just yeah, sitting there. And, uh, at the time, I didn't have a particularly long lens on, so I would have been maybe two or three metres away from it, which was quite cool to really get a good look at it and it had a good look at me. Uh, but yeah, luckily it wasn't thinking about dinner because it was a freshwater crocodile. And then another of the very incredible animals up in Kakadu is this guy here, the Northern Spadefoot. Um, just a, a very interesting frog which has the ability when it calls, it really inflates its entire body and you'll often find them uh, just sitting in the water you know, in a, a little shallow bit of water that's filled up during the wet season. And as they're calling, uh, their vocal sac actually sends out vibrations through, through the water. And so it looks a bit like, you know, when you might see a boat going through the water, the wake left behind it. And that th this frog here is sending it out. Um, it's really, really interesting to watch that, um, yeah, I guess, visually see the sound in a way. Um, but yeah. In the wet season, so when I was up there, um, there's just frogs everywhere. It's just amazing to just really encounter uh, an area with just so much life. Yeah. Um, and th this frog here is probably uh, maybe a bit bigger than a tennis ball, so it's a, a decent sized frog as well. Uh, one of the many, many highlights up of Northern Australia 
and something I've wanted to see since I was about, you know, very, very, very young, maybe three or four, um, was a ghost bat. And so on one of the evenings, we were walking around and um, it started to rain quite heavily as it did basically every day and every night, but you'd have a few hours in between and we decided to go under this really, really large sandstone overhang and as we get around the corner, there's about half a dozen ghost bats, which is the bat on the left here, just sitting there quietly out of the rain. And you can see how wet it is as well on its back. Um, it was just such an incredible moment just to be so close to them. And unfortunately, ghost bats have really been hit quite hard by cane toads, because uh, cane toads are about the size that a ghost bat would try and eat one. And of course it gets poisoned and then uh, dies. So they've really uh, dropped back in numbers a lot and have been lost from a lot of sites in Queensland, really, really hard to see. So it's just amazing to pretty much stumble upon one. And then, yeah, about 20 metres down uh, under that same really large sandstone rock was this uh, common sheath tail bat on the right, which is quite a cool looking bat. And uh, yeah, was also happy to get out of the rain for a bit. And then very quickly, here are a few more animals uh, from within Kakadu National Park. Uh, you can really see the ones on the right and that frog in the middle, the rock hole frog. They're all very dependent upon these sandstone escarpments. Um, and so those sandstone escarpments have driven uh, speciation of a lot of these animals and provided refuge during times when it's drier because uh, that rock you know, allows more humidity and really just uh, is perfect spot for all these reptiles and amphibians. And then up the top left, you'll see an animal which might look somewhat familiar to you guys. Um, and it's quite closely related to the sugar glider that we get locally, uh, but it's called the savanna glider. Um, and it, yeah, inhabits sort of these northern uh, monsoonal woodlands and um, tropical areas. So again, that was sort of only described not particularly long ago. Uh, originally it was thought, you know, to be a sort of funny looking sugar glider in a way, uh, but it's actually its own species now. So lots of very, very cool animals. And then finally, um, a few different animals here. The um, pygmy mulga snake up the top right was quite a cool find. We were just walking around in the afternoon and it actually, sort of shot off from between my legs as I was stepping over this branch um, and managed to follow it down and get a photograph. Uh, and then as you go down clockwise, you've got a Douglas skink. And then this little toadlet here is a Jabiru toadlet, which is only found around Jabiru uh, within Kakadu National Park. So it has a very, very small distribution. And then this Dulls aquatic frog on the left, is actually quite interesting because it's poisonous. Um, there's not that many frogs in Australia that are poisonous, but the Dahl's aquatic frog is. Uh, and then you've got this wonderful long neck turtle up the top, which is again, only sort of found around the Darwin area. So we're now going to leave the Northern Territory and head over to Queensland. Uh, I'm lucky of to have been to Cairns twice and up further north to Ca uh, Cape York Peninsula once. Uh, but yeah, I'll briefly be talking about sort of the area north of Ravenshoe. Um, I'm yet to go in that area south of Ravenshoe down to sort of Townsville, which is part of the wet tropics, but uh, has a little bit different fauna as well compared to the north half. Uh, one thing, again, it's a world heritage area, so you know it's going to be really good for wildlife um, and it really really is it has very high levels of endemism in both the flora and the fauna um, so just so much wildlife that is only found in this small area um, and i'll speak in a minute about you know there are some things that really take it to the extreme there like quite a few different frogs which are only found on one single mountain um, you know, and that's it. In the entire world, they're found on one pretty small mountain, um, you know, and there's lots of reptiles like that as well. Um, just pretty insane to think about, really. Um, and a lot of that 
has to do with, again, that litho refugia and the rainforest refugia. So the, again, those areas with a lot of rock um, throughout history have been able to support different, um, you know, frogs and reptiles and things like that. And as they get separated from each other, they're able to speciate uh, because they're just able to persist in areas, but it gets drier in the middle between them. So they can no longer access what would have been their ancestors. And then again, for size wise, the entire wet tropics bioregion, um, again, it's quite large, you know, similar to the Sydney Basin um, and the World Heritage Area of that uh, occupies a pretty sizable area, about half of it. Um, you know, the other half has been unfortunately developed. You know, there's a lot of uh, turf farms and stuff on the Atherton Tableland. Uh, but the other good thing, similar to Kakadu, is there's a lot of uh, sort of ecotourism opportunities. And so as a result, people have, I guess, been financially incentivized to uh, promote, but also conserve the wildlife of the area. You know, things like the Southern Castle area are definitely an icon of the area and something that locals care about a lot, which is really good. So I will kick it off with an amazing looking dragon on the left here called the Boyd's Forest Dragon. Um, and this guy lives, yeah, pretty deep within the rainforest and just spends all its time, uh, yeah, in a pretty shady life, really. Uh, doesn't get to see the sun much, but is just such an impressive looking lizard. Um, and later on, I'll show you guys a photo of its relative, uh, which you can actually get all the way down to the central coast. So the sort of two in that genus um, within Australia. Then on the right, at the top, you've got an eastern small-eyed snake, which is a snake we actually get uh, in Sydney as well, but it looks a little bit different down here. Um, they generally don't get quite as big as this large individual here. Um, and then below that, you have a crest turtle, which is a fairly widespread turtle, but uh, quite a cool species. And it's one of the short neck turtles. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen the long necks that we get around Sydney. Um, but yeah, short necks are a bit less common. And then in the middle, we have the northern leaf-tailed gecko, which is a very large leaf-tailed gecko. Um, and it's in the genus Sultuarius, which actually means keeper of the forest, which is a pretty cool name. And they definitely are a bit of a keeper of the forest. You'll see them if you get their eye shine with your torch, uh, which is just the reflection from their eye. Uh, you can see them from a very long way away. The first one I ever saw was back 30 meters up this really large rainforest tree about a minute after I saw that small ad snake. Um, it was way up. Obviously, I couldn't get a photo that high up, but luckily we found a few later on a bit lower down. And then on the bottom left, this is actually the same species as a diamond python, but a different subspecies. So this is uh, the Shani subspecies, which you only get in the wet tropics. Um, yeah, a very, very striking snake as well. And of course, it is really, really, really cool that the wet tropics has tree kangaroos. Uh, and they've actually got two different species of tree kangaroo. There's the Bennett's tree kangaroo, which is really, really rare and very hard to find. It's, you know, not doing too well. And that's found just around the Dane tree area. Um, you know, Bennett's tree kangaroos probably get sighted you know, once a year, if that. Um, so it's a, almost an elusive animal, like, you know, almost mythical, I guess. Um, and then this is the Lumholtz tree kangaroo, which is a bit more common, but still quite rare. Um, and that's mainly just due to habitat fragmentation. You know, they obviously don't like coming down to the ground, but if they're in a, a small isolated patch of forest, then they don't really have many options. And then once they're down on the ground, there's a lot of, uh, unfamiliar predators, you know, including cars. Um, so they do have, you know, a lot of problems, but quite interestingly, uh, there is a little population on the edge of the Narada tea plantation. Um, and so that's where I photographed this one here. So they seem to do fairly well there. Uh, I probably saw about half a dozen whilst I was there. So that was very exciting. And another very, very rare uh, frog 
This one's called the Taranda tree frog, uh, Latoria myola. Um, as the name suggests, it's only found within like the, I guess, suburb uh, of Karanda. So a very, very small distribution, like only known from a handful of creeks. Um, and so, yeah, obviously I found this one and a couple others uh, at Karanda on a very wet night, again, in the wet season in January of about two years ago. Um, but yeah, just amazing to think that, you know, there is a, an animal out there that has such a small range. Um, just, yeah, very, very interesting. Now, moving on to another very, even more interesting frog, uh, is the armored mist frog. Uh, this photo of me looking somewhat cheery on the left was taken about a third of the way on my enormous mission uh, to try and see the armored mist frog. And so it's you basically you've got to drive to the bottom of this mountain and then walk up a very, very, very large mountain. Uh, and so, of course, because I was in there in uh, January, uh, this photo was taken about maybe 5 or 6 p.m. and it was still about 36 degrees with, you know, 95 to 99% humidity whilst climbing up, you know, and it was constantly uphill for about six hours. Um, mm -hmm with about, you know, I don't know, 12 kilos of camera equipment on my back. But I was very determined uh, and very, very excited. So, you know, uh, the Toria lorica, the armored mist frog, was thought to be extinct for quite some time until they were found at this one little population, uh, which, of course, the location of has been kept pretty quiet, um, just so that, you know, they don't get disturbed and, uh, you know, no one tries to poach one or something. Um, so I finally get right up to the top and then I was with two of my friends and one of them sprained their ankle just as we're about 300 metres away from where we have to start following the creek down. Um, and luckily my other friend uh, stayed with them and you know they made their way back slowly down the mountain. Uh, but obviously you know, they were okay with me going ahead and looking for this frog, but I was now on my own. And uh, there's not many things I don't like in the Australian bush, but I don't particularly like running into scrub bulls. Um, and I'd found some pretty big uh, cow patties, you know, uh, along the fire trail and also along the creek. Uh, and of course, there was no reception and it was getting on. So I was a bit uh, anxious about the thought of walking into a cow um, who probably wouldn't be that excited, but I pushed on and followed this really, really strong flowing uh, creek down and eventually um, got to this sort of waterfall that was just absolutely charging with water and it was, had to be very careful that I didn't fall in. Um, and then eventually, you know, had a little look around there for five minutes and it was about midnight by this stage and I was rewarded with this amazing armoured mist frog, which was just incredible to encounter and just such a beautiful frog. Um, and so I sort of hung around that area and found maybe two or three of them. Um, and yeah, just spent a bit of time with them until about two in the morning and then decided to make my way back down the mountain and finally hopped into my tent at about five in the morning and woke up at about seven. So it was a very, very good night. Now, this is another very interesting place. And so it's basically a mountain made up of enormous granite boulders. And to give an idea of scale, it's very hard, but this big boulder uh, in the foreground here, you know, is the size of a, a large four wheel drive. And so you've just got this massive mountain and it's just stacks and stacks of boulders. But as a result, there's, you know, Drop it drops down and sort of an unknown depth. So as you're hopping across these boulders, you're thinking, "Gee, I really hope I don't slip." Uh, there's been uh, herds of cattle that have just disappeared into this mountain, and people who have disappeared into this mountain. It's a, a very interesting place. Um, yeah, it's called Kalkajaka or Black Mountain, uh, and you can sort of just see on the right 
here, there's a little bit of rainforest. And so because these rocks heat up and are covered in this sort of black moss, um, it really is quite good for rainforest and there's a lot of moisture. And so on this mountain, basically everything you can see in this photo here, uh, there are sort of four um, sort of reptiles and amphibians that are only found on this mountain. So of course, I was very keen to have a look around this mountain. Uh, but obviously, only hopping around the foreground, uh, even while we were there at night, there was this almighty explosion, which was one of these large boulders as it was cooling down at night. It obviously cracked because they, they would heat up, you know, ridiculously throughout the day and then cool down a lot. And so it just exploded. Um, so you don't, you know, it's a, a bit of a dangerous game looking for these animals, but it's definitely worth it. Um, and of course, all the animals that live on Kalkajaka look like the rocks, you know? They've got this amazing patterning that just blends in perfectly. It's just amazing. And so this is the Black Mountain Gecko, uh, just incredible, like with that golden eye and uh, just, just stunning, like what a wonderful animal. And then of course, the Black Mountain Boulder Frog, uh, Cofixilus saxatilis. Um, and that genus, the Cofixilus, um, has a lot of diversity within the wet tropics. So there's a lot of different species and they're basically all found within that area. Some get a bit further north and a little bit further south. Uh, but yeah, they make this sort of tapping noise, like da, 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 da. Um, and so in the afternoon, there was a little bit of a shower and all of a sudden, within the rocks that you know you were standing on from below you some of them standing 20 meters down you were hearing this sort of chorus of tapping and just yeah very interesting and eerie um, and then this gecko here is sort of undescribed at this point uh, at the moment it's referred to as another name but the population on Kalkajaka look nothing like any of the other populations which are mostly sort of a whitish cream color um, so it's probably going to be a new species in the near future. Um, so that it'll probably be called the Black Mountain Patella. And then finally, to prove that I don't just spend all my time out at night and I actually do sometimes wake during the day, there is a Black Mountain Rock Skink, uh, which again is another endemic and it's pretty common on the mountain. You'll see a lot of them scurrying around and they're very adept at jumping from rock to rock and very, very active little skinks. Now, bringing it back to New South Wales, I normally I'd ask if anyone's been here, but it's sort of hard to get responses, but put it in the chat if you have. This is probably my favorite place in New South Wales and possibly within all of Australia. Um, it's just a very, uh, yeah, powerful place with just wonderful wildlife and very, very uh, good wilderness as well. And so, as the name suggests, it's on the edge of Queensland and New South Wales, uh, sort of up near Kyogre Way. And then in terms of size, it's a lot, lot smaller than uh, the places I've mentioned earlier. Uh, but keep in mind, it's still uh, sort of about twice the size of Karingai Chase National Park, uh, which in itself is quite large. So the Border Ranges is still a very large area and for its size, it has very uh, impressive diversity and abundance of wildlife. And uh, this photo here you can see is me with a tree that is, uh, I'm told is 5,000 years old, which is just in itself, you know, even if there were no animals in the National Park, that, that tree alone is just, incredible and uh you know when that tree was a seedling the human population on the planet was like 60 million um and so that tree has been alive from when we've gone from 60 million to you know seven or eight billion like just ridiculous and then it's got incredible frogs and one in particular which is just amazing and that's this guy here uh the marsupial frog or the hip pocket frog or the pouched frog, it's got a few names, but I think you can probably get the idea from its three different names that it is uh, very, very interesting. And so it's actually the only frog that has featured on, uh, sorry, the only Australian frog that has featured on a David Attenborough documentary. 
Um, and the reason because is, you know, we're often taught as children, you know, this is what frogs do. And so frogs will go to a body of water um, and then they'll lay their eggs in the water, they'll turn into tadpoles and they'll hop out and it will be very predictable uh, and a very straightforward. Um, but there is absolutely nothing straightforward or predictable about this. And so basically this frog is uh, about two centimetres long. It's a tiny, tiny frog and it lives in these um, rainforests, uh, a few different kinds of rainforests, but where I saw this one was amongst all this Antarctic beach, uh, which is incredible as well. It's sort of a Gondwanan uh, plant and a lot of the border ranges is you know, got Gondwanan origins. It's part of the um, Gondwanan World Heritage Area. And so this frog, the male will call from under a leaf or under a log or something, under a rock. And uh, if the female is interested, she'll uh, come over, check him out and lay eggs there and then basically go away. And then it's his job to look after these little eggs. Um, and so for a few weeks, the little frogs are inside uh, the egg, but this egg isn't in water, it's on land. Uh, but because it's under the leaf litter and the rocks and the logs, it's got enough moisture uh, to keep them, you know, okay. And then after a few weeks, once they've sort of grown a little bit bigger, what they have to do is they have to basically climb out of their egg and into pockets on the side of this frog. But the problem is there's not enough room in his pockets. And so the tadpoles basically have to race and compete and climb in these pockets. And this is, you know, the first time they've ever left their egg. And then they complete the rest of their development inside these little pockets on his hip. Um, and that is how, you know, you get the marsupial frog. It's just amazing and so different to anything we're ever taught about how frogs work. But within Australia, because we have such an unpredictable climate, you know, frogs have to, uh, you know, I guess, invent uh, ways to get around that lack of water and that unpredictability of water. So there are so many fascinating adaptations that you know, Australian frogs really have just pioneered the way to leave the water in a way. Uh, another really cool threatened species, uh, like the last, uh, is the Stevens banded snake. Uh, this little guy here. Uh, this one was actually quite a young one, only about 20 centimetres long. Uh, and they're in a genus called Hoplocephalus, uh, which also has the broad headed snake, which some of you might have heard about. Uh, which lives in Sydney, uh, which is also an endangered species. Uh, but one of the, the very interesting and somewhat scary things about uh, that genus of snakes is uh, in the very unlikely situation you were to get bitten, uh, it, they actually have been reported to make you bleed from like every hole in your body, uh, which sounds extremely painful. Um, but then there's also mixed reports of people not really being affected at all. So it's quite an interesting snake uh, and an interesting scenario with a lot of different venoms that uh, the effects seem to vary a lot between person to person and uh, even you know from snake to snake sometimes people have reacted differently from being bitten once uh, at, or twice at separate times from the same species but yeah the stevens banded snake is uh, definitely at home in the rainforest so it's quite active even on cooler nights. When I found this individual, it was uh, maybe only 14 or 15 degrees and it was raining at the time. So yeah, it's quite comfortable being out. Not all snakes, you know, need it to be really hot. And then this is the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is related to the Boyd's Forest Dragon. And so this is the Southern Angle-Headed Dragon. Uh, it's fairly common at the border ranges. It can be quite hard to find elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, I've had quite a lot of luck finding them in the border ranges and they're just quite a, a cool lizard. Again, they don't really need much sunlight, which is good because living in a rainforest, it can be quite hard to get uh, sunlight. Now, moving on, another place within New South Wales, but really only just, it's in the far, far northwestern corner. Um, a lot of you might have heard of uh, Cameron Corner. 
And so that's basically to get there from New South Wales, you pass through Sturt National Park. Uh, and again, it's a, a very, very different place to everywhere I've mentioned so far. Um, you know, the rainforest has plenty of water. Um, I guess uh, the climate of a rainforest does vary throughout the year, but you know, it's relatively predictable. Um, same with, you know, Kakadu and the wet tropics with a, a very distinct wet season and dry season, and that can change a little bit. Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, it doesn't change a lot. But obviously you're out in the desert now, um, and Sturt National Park is a stony desert, really less so a sandy desert. Um, in this photo here, you can see a, what's called gibber in the front, um, and you can get really, really large expanses of gibber, which you basically feel like you're on the moon or something because there's heaps and heaps of these little rocks. Um, and, you know, after a prolonged period of drought, basically no vegetation whatsoever. It's really hot and uh, the land is just reflecting all that heat. Um, but then here you've got like an interesting transition uh, to the sand dune country. And so in the west of Sir, you start getting into this parallel sand dune country. Uh, and so you get uh, quite, uh, yeah, it's quite different. You've got these dunes and these swales between the dunes, which uh, after periods of rain, they sort of fill up and become little clay pans. And it really is this land of boom and bust. Luckily, I went out there twice last year uh, following good rain once the roads had dried up. And so it was just alive with, you know, thousands of budgies and uh, gibber bird. You know, there's a bird which basically just lives in the gibber. Uh, why on earth you would want to do that, I don't know. But amazingly, somehow they survive even through summer when the temperatures are, you know, in the 40s every day for so long of the day and they're just sitting out there with no shade whatsoever. Just incredible what wildlife does to survive and how they just fill any niche possible when given an opportunity. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Australia really is a bit of a shadow of its former self, uh, which is a shame, but thanks to a lot of hard work and, you know, really careful planning, um, it, places like this are returning a bit to what they were like historically. So there was overgrazing in the past, and so you lost a lot of the cane grass and things like that. Um, and of course, feral species, particularly cats out this way, uh, caused the extinction of things like bilbies and a lot of stuff like that. Uh, but recently they've reintroduced things like bilbies, uh, mulgara, and a lot of other small mammals. Um, and they all have a really big impact on changing the ecosystem as well uh, through digging and that helps, you know, seeds to germinate and things like that. So it's quite smart to be using wildlife to help the fauna because typically, uh, sorry, to help the flora because typically the flora um, really impacts the fauna more. Um, so it's sort of interesting trying to reverse that and then having flow on effects on the fauna that's already there. So this wonderful bird here uh, is pretty uncommon in New South Wales. It's called a black-breasted buzzard. Uh, it's listed as endangered. And uh, if you've ever been to the bird show at Taronga Zoo, you've probably seen a buzzard dropping like a rock on an emu egg. Uh, so that's the same bird as this, or the same species, not that individual. Um, but yeah, a really, really interesting bird. And it, it quite likes um, the arid areas a lot. Um, but I was lucky enough to come across a nesting pair, which was very exciting for New South Wales. Uh, there's not that many nests of them. So yeah, that was quite cool. And they're just a stunning bird to photograph and just to watch in the early morning light, you can see it was pretty early and yeah. So now you might be looking at this photo and be a bit confused, like, did Jaden steal its front legs or something? But no, I assure you that this is the Southern Sand Slider and it's at the point in time where it's decided it no longer needs its front legs and it can definitely make do with just two legs. Very bizarre. Um, and it's in that a genus called Larista, which quite a lot of, uh, I guess, permutations of how many legs they have. Some have just front legs and no back legs. Some have like no legs. Some have all their legs and two toes and some have all their legs and three toes. It's just very interesting. But you can also see it's got a very pointy snout. Um, 
which really helps it bury beneath the sand. And so it sort of just swims like a snake through the sand and it doesn't need the legs because that's a more efficient way to move. And as I guess, you know, we've really captured it halfway through this process in, you know, many more millions of years. It probably won't have any legs at all. Uh, but yeah, we're just fortunate to see it with two legs and looking quite bizarre. And this little guy here is a fat-tailed dunnart. Uh, there's quite a few different species of dunnart within Australia, or about 20. Um, within New South Wales, we're lucky to have a few of them, maybe about uh, four or five, probably. Um, and yeah, the, the fat-tailed dunnart is the most common out at Sturt. Uh, and yes, yeah, sort of looks a bit like a small native mouse, and it'll eat a lot of invertebrates and things like that. Um, and yeah, it's just really, really wonderful to witness all these small native mammals that we have and uh, that we just really don't appreciate or think about enough. Uh, I think I had right at the beginning of my presentation a photo of the striped face on art as well. Um, yeah, they're really, really cool. And I guess a lot of people will obviously consider them art oh, just a mouse or it's just a rat, but it's you know far from that. And, Australia has many wonderful rats as well that are native, so yeah. And even though, you know, you're 11 hours inland and nowhere near the coast and in the desert, there are still frogs out there. Uh, even, you know, a few weeks after rain, I was lucky to find this Soodles frog uh, walking along the sand dune, not far from that Dunnart, and you can see he's just sort of dug himself up out of the sand dune that night and still covered in a lot of the uh, red sand as well. And same with this eastern water holding frog, um, same deal, they'll, you know, wait underground and for years if it's during a drought, they, you know, they can stay underground for almost a decade. Um, they sort of shrivel up within their own skin. So they've got a bit of a, a moisture bubble and that shed a layer of skin as well. Um, and then when they are ready to emerge and they sense the rain, they'll eat that layer of skin that they shed many years ago. And that gives them that little boost of nutrition and then they're ready to explore and see what life is like after 10 years underground. Uh, I will just quickly check the time, sorry. Cool. Well, timing is going pretty well. This is gonna be the last place I'll speak about. And it's a place that is very important to me and just really, really wonderful I've spent so much time out in Karinga Chase and Garigal National Park. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, so I'll just go through pretty quickly all this stuff. Again, you're looking at litho refugia, all that sandstone really creates all these many different habitat types as the sandstone erodes and you get different layers of soil types. Um, it's also fantastic for reptiles and amphibians with all that rock. Um, and it's quite an interesting area, uh, Sydney. You sort of get species that are basically at their southern limit and a lot of other species which are at their northern limit. Uh, one very special animal of Karingai and Garigal is the southern brown bandicoot, which is ridiculously rare in New South Wales now. And it's the northern limit in Karingai Chase National Park. Uh, you still can get them there, but they're very, very hard to find. Um, but yeah, we're just very fortunate that they are still there. Um, and yeah, there's just very powerful Aboriginal presence throughout the whole area. I'm sure a lot of you have seen engravings, but there's lots of hand stencils and just a very alive story uh, of the land. One of the uh, wonderful snakes that I'm pretty fortunate to see somewhat frequently up there in summer is the common death adder. Uh, which generally isn't particularly common, but it's pretty widespread. Um, and within our area, they sort of come in three different colours, uh, mainly grey, but also red. And very occasionally you get like a few different shades of brown, so sandy coloured or sometimes dark brown. And they're actually the fastest striking snake in the world. So the human reaction time is about 0.2 of a second and a death adder can strike in like 0.15 of a second. So before you even know. Uh, but they're, despite being the fastest striking snake in the world, they actually move around pretty slowly uh, when you know they're only gonna strike um, and they only have that need to strike so fast because they're an ambush predator. So 
you can see it at its tail, it's got this sort of funny little detail. That's called a caudal lure, and it looks a little bit like a rainbow-coloured worm. Uh, and they sort of wiggle that around slowly once a rodent or something gets within the area. And it might have been sitting still for months, buried under leaf litter. So when the you know, prey sees that flicking, it'll get interested, and that's why it then has to strike really fast. Uh, because it, it really just doesn't move. And they radio tracked some females um, maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. And they found that they, I think they had like, some of them didn't move more than 20 metres squared in their life. Um, just insane, just such a tiny home range. The males move around a bit more to look for mates. And so that's how I'll often come across males um, at night, uh, you know, often on the front of a storm. And then another very unique animal is the eastern pygmy possum. Uh, this guy is also endangered and is probably quite well known, which is a good thing in the last sort of 10 years, pygmy possums have had a bit of rise to fame, which is very well deserved. I mean, they're very cute. Uh, and within New South Wales, again, I would pretty confidently say that uh, Karingai Chase and Garigal are the spots to see them. I've been pretty lucky to see a lot of them, but Throughout the rest of New South Wales, there's very sort of not that many records of them. And another animal which sort of has avoided water as much as it can is the red crowned toadlet, which is only found within Sydney. And you can see it's um, eggs up the top. So again, it lays these hard eggs. And instead of climbing into pockets on the hip, after about four weeks, if the rain arrives at the right time, these eggs get washed down into a bigger pool of water and then they complete the rest of their development there. So again, they have a few weeks without water. Um, and again, that's a really good thing because as I said, water can be very unpredictable. And a lot of different legless reptiles. So up the top, you've got a blind snake, um, which is a snake, it looks like a big worm. Then at the bottom, you've got a common scaly foot, which is actually a kind of a legless gecko. And then in the middle, a Burton's legless lizard, which looks like a snake, but again, it's a legless lizard in its own sort of genus. A limb-reduced skink at the bottom, a three-toed skink, uh, which is also only found in Sydney. Um, well, that's, no, that's not true, sorry. Um, it's what the interesting thing is, they, um, lower populations give birth to live, uh, no, Lower populations lay eggs, and then these more uh, highland populations give birth to live young. So the ones in Sydney are a little bit different to the ones in the Blue Mountains. Uh, but you can get them a lot further north as well. And then, of course, a red-bellied black snake, which everyone knows. And then a lot of different geckos locally as well. You've got the thick-tailed gecko on the left and the broad-tailed gecko, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. You might get them in your garage and then a velvet gecko on the right and an eastern stone gecko on the left. So yeah, a bit of negativity at the end, but this is just to remind you of what we're facing. And of course, a few ideas of what you can do sort of to mitigate that. You know, living in Sydney, a lot of people are very well off, have plenty of money and, you know, they think, oh, I should invest my money somewhere. I'd really recommend you to, I guess, consider the idea of investing in nature by buying either a bush block or ex farmland and revegetating it. Um, and that's an investment in the planet, but also, you know, your future offspring if you have children. And it, you know, it's something good to do, it's somewhere you can visit and really feel a connection with, but it's also something you can give back to improve biodiversity. Um, yeah, I would really, really recommend rather than buying some ugly unit somewhere in Sydney. Um, and then donating your money to places like the Australian Wildlife Conservancy is very, very worthwhile as well. Um, they do fantastic work on reintroducing species and removing ferals and doing proper fire regimes and things like that. They just have a lot of science behind what they do and a lot of passion to really you know, make sure things don't go extinct in Australia. A lot of things you can do by donating your time as well. Uh, recording all the fauna that you see on Bionet New South Wales is worthwhile. Um, helping out with local bush regen, building nest boxes, um, 
yeah, even planting trees in your local neighborhood, man, you know, a tree is a good thing to do. And burning your lawn, um, get rid of lawn, lawn is terrible. Put lots of native plants in your garden. If you really, really like grass, get some native grass, you know, there's plenty of nice native grasses which will benefit animals, but having just a nice little bit of lawn does no, no good for wildlife and, you know, if you have wildlife in your garden, you will be happier and your mental health will be generally better. So I'd really recommend you get rid of your lawn. And then obviously fall in love with nature, which is much, much easier than it sounds. You know, we have a wonderful national park right on our doorstep. So it's so easy to do. And then, you know, eventually when we're allowed to visit some of those places I mentioned, like it's really worthwhile. I don't think you will regret it. And, you know, I really just scratched the surface on the tiniest fraction of wonderful places within Australia that are just full of wildlife. Um, and so I'd really, really recommend you check that out. And yeah. So hopefully I have time for questions. I rambled a little bit, so sorry about that. But I should hopefully have time for a bit of questions. Yes, definitely a little bit of time for questions. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was absolutely brilliant. And those photos just topped it off. It's so good to have that visual component. Um, so one of our questions that have come through is what resources do you use to find some of these more cryptic species? Okay. Um, there are a few very good websites and uh, resources. Um, Generally, like so, it, it depends on what it is, but the Atlas of Living Australia is a website I'd recommend you check out if you do want to see any of these animals. And so what that'll do is that'll give you an idea of the sort of areas that they've been seen in the past. And from that, uh, you'll get an idea of sort of the habitat um, that you might find them in. And so from there, you can have a look. But uh, I guess, yeah, in addition, really, I guess looking, I've got a lot of different field guides, but also a lot of different friends who are into this. And so, you know, spend a lot of time discussing and thinking about where these animals might be. Um, and then, yeah, really just going out and having a look, you're obviously never guaranteed you're going to find what you're looking for, but you can definitely increase your chances by really knowing where you might be able to find it. Uh, and then like, for example, for birds, there's a website called eBird and an app, which is quite good. Again, you can check out where birds have been seen if you're interested in seeing something. Um, and then of course, sort of resource in the terms of uh, field equipment is really important as well. So um, I have a very good spotlight called a lead lenser H14 R.2, which, uh, you know, maybe cost me about $200, which really isn't that much for how good it is. And that will just dramatically increase your chance of finding nocturnal wildlife. Uh, you'll be able to pick up eye shine. Um, also, you know, I think one of the wonderful things I was taught when I was very little was, you know, really using all your senses and listening a lot. A lot of the things that I find I don't find by seeing them first, I might hear them, uh, whether it's a frog or a bird or, you know, even a reptile running through. So, um, and, you know, occasionally even smelling, you can smell certain animals. Um, so yeah, really thinking about using all your senses and being very quiet and being very present within wherever you are when you're walking and um, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of uh, time and patience is involved in that exercise, absolutely. But some great tips. Um, we've had another question, which is maybe a little bit controversial, but definitely relates to um, biodiversity. What are your thoughts on Brumbies in Kosciuszko National Park and the impacts that they're having on our native flora and fauna? Um, well, I've actually um, worked for about uh, two months down in the snowy mountains, uh, maybe two years ago doing frog surveys and stuff like that. Um, so I've, you know, spent quite a lot of time down there. Um, and yeah, feral horses really, or brumbies, um, really don't have a place, uh, arguably anywhere within Australia. Um, I would say they're, <sighs> they're, 
not like they're a domesticated animal which has since been re-released so i guess in a way they're almost human created they they don't necessarily have a natural habitat that they're from but they're the same as any horse you might see in a paddock and so that horse you might see in a paddock is uh well protected you'd say because it has uh, you know no competition uh and it's managed as such versus looking at this sort of alpine ecosystem which is very restricted um and has species like you know the alpine she oak skink uh, northern and southern corroboree frogs um you know stocky galaxias um burlong frog all these animals which are only found there um, mountain pygmy possum like just very very unique uh wonders of evolution that only occur there that are being impacted by horses and by many other things as well um but yeah i think that horses definitely need to go from alpine areas in australia um and that is a sort of an, an urgent matter that really needs to be dealt with quickly you know the southern corroboree frog has already gone extinct in the wild uh, from chytrid fungus which was spread partly by horses and so it's sort of like i don't know to me it seems like a no-brainer that of course you're going to protect these animals that are only found there and like look amazing like the southern corroboree frog and the northern corroboree frog are you know bright yellow and black and only found there and you know they have that partly direct development like red crown toadlets as well which in itself is just amazing and that should be uh, preserved and i guess in the dna of all these animals that naturally occur there is the story of the land you know the story of time and the story of that place is really within these animals so yeah yeah it's um definitely extremely tricky isn't it and as land managers trying to balance all those different factors when we um, deal with issues such as that. Mm -hmm. I guess we are kind of going a little bit over time, but maybe just one question to round it off, um, if you're happy to answer that, Jaden. Um, so we've had one a question about the recent reports that frogs are dehydrated and, you know, obviously dying in quite large numbers recently. Do you have any comments on that or advice? Um, it, yeah. It sort of seems to be related to uh, chytrid fungus again, which it wasn't naturally occurring in Australia up until uh, maybe uh, 30 years ago, I think, about then. And so uh, chytrid fungus doesn't really like cold temperatures. It, can, it really likes being between like five degrees and 30 degrees. And so I think if you've got like, like a warmer, wetter winter, which we possibly have had this year, uh, that's probably why we're seeing it um, affecting a lot of frogs again. Um, but yeah, I guess it's very visible at the moment in terms of the effects of it, but uh, chytrid fungus has already driven us seven Australian frog species to extinction. Uh, so it, it really is a big problem. At this stage, you know, there isn't much that uh individuals can do other than definitely recording any uh frog that you might find that looks sick and injured and submitting that to the frog id app which is like part of the australian museum um, but yeah it's very difficult to control this fungus which is within the environment um, that shouldn't be there you can they've had success like uh getting it out of an individual frog by uh you know heating this frog up to 35 degrees and then the fungus dies off and that might be great for a pet frog or something but obviously it's not uh, a good solution but hopefully yeah in the near future we will get a landscape solution that yeah stops any frogs further going extinct yeah definitely um well it is now just a little bit after six o'clock so i won't keep you from your dinner any longer Jaden. um thank you so much for your time tonight i hope everyone enjoyed that i know i've certainly just jotted down a few new places that i'm going to travel to after lockdown um so yeah everyone enjoy their evenings and thank you once again see you later guys mm -hmm.